Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University, and welcome to Vlog 75, Epistemology. This vlog comes via request, as just about all of them do, and it also comes in response to an earlier vlog, a vlog I conducted with Professor David McGillivray about interdisciplinarity. And in that vlog, David raised three clear terms, stating that they were crucial to our understanding of a doctorate, but also research. And those three terms were epistemology, ontology and methodology. And both Tanya and Mona asked if I would do vlogs on each of these three clear terms and present them in a way that starts with a relatively straightforward knowledge base, but then demonstrates their use in doctoral education. So it's my absolute pleasure to do so. These three terms are the holy trinity of knowledge, or if I change from religious metaphors, they are the three wise monkeys of research. I love the three wise monkeys, I've been obsessed by the three wise monkeys, but they are the three wise monkeys of research. So for the next three vlogs, we are going to go and do some quick and dirty work on these three crucial, important terms. So each of these terms operate in the philosophy of knowledge. And most of you have seen I get quite amused and bemused when people say, oh, there are so many differences between doing a PhD in biology or chemistry or computer science or business or media or literature or law. There are so many differences. And I always just sort of have to remind people that 95% of you are enrolled in one degree, a doctor of philosophy. The doctor of philosophy is the degree of the university, bestowed by the university. So you learn, I think, a lot about that term, philosophy. You learn that it matters a lot in every single discipline that you would study. And for example, I remember when we were in Canada and one of Steve's students in the law program said to him, Steve, why are we spending all this time looking at jurisprudence? Why does jurisprudence matter so much? For the non-lawyers amongst us, jurisprudence is the theory of law. And Steve said, you can't understand law without a theory of law. Boom. You can't understand computer science without a theory of computer science. You can't understand history without, without a theory of history. You can't understand physics without a theory of physics. You can't understand education without a theory of education. And if you needed any more evidence about the importance of philosophy, then you need look no further than Planet of the Apes. Big fan. Now think about how the apes were organised, right? So the gorillas were the big guys that were on the big horses and they wandered around and they beat people up. Their job was to beat people up. Repressive state apparatuses from Aldazir, for the, the Aldazirians out there. That's what the gorillas did. They loved that. The chimpanzees were the everyday workers, the people in the offices, the people on farms, the people that did the actual work. But let's talk about the orangutans. Besides having the coolest clothing, they also ran the place. They were the philosophers. They were the thinkers. So the thinkers ran the planet of the apes. Isn't it sad that the planet of the humans is not run by philosophers? But I digress. So we're going to enter some pretty deep thinking in the next few vlogs that I'm challenging you to think about the nature of knowledge. So this is the big stuff. You cannot write a PhD without some sense of epistemology, ontology and methodology. But I don't want you frightened by those terms and I don't want you embarrassed thinking, oh, I really don't know what they mean. Trust me, on a weekly basis, I'm thinking, What's my epistemology? What am I doing here? And so I dip back into the literature. I, I get what I'm doing, and then I don't get what I'm doing. I'm going, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? That is the epistemological question. Okay. And I've always said, and I love the doubt. So go with the doubt. Go with the questioning. Go, oh, get a bit unstable. Think through some stuff. That's great. Because the people you have to watch in life are the ones that are absolutely confident and certain that they know what they're doing. And those people are either ignorant, foolish, or indeed fascists. But I digress. So let's do this. What is epistemology? Right, so like so many of the terms that come from philosophy, they emerge from the ancient Greeks and indeed ancient Greece. Now, the ancient Greeks were incredibly cool. They didn't wear shoes. That's tremendous. 
rock on the ancient Greeks. The problem is you've got to forget stuff like slavery and the treatment of women. But besides slavery and the treatment of women, the ancient Greeks were really cool. And Socrates was really the embodiment of that coolness because he wandered round ancient Athens asking questions, difficult, complicated, challenging questions. And that, of course, became the Socratic method. The great thing about Socrates, though, is he went round asking questions, I believe, because he was trying to get away from his wife, Zanhippe. Zanhippe was a tre tremendously difficult woman. In fact, one of Socrates' students recorded his view of his wife as, quote, the hardest to get along with of all the women that there are. What a great line. So basically, Socrates developed the Socratic method to get away from his wife. But I digress. So epistemology as a word, has two bits to it. Episteme, which is knowledge, and logos, which is logical discourse. Together, they create epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. Epistemology, the theory of knowledge. So, why do we believe what we believe? Why do we doubt? And how do we justify our position on a particular topic. Epistemology maps out what we believe and what we believe that we know. Epistemology makes us ask how we know what we know. For example, really complicated example that I'm going to deploy here from really basic maths. So this is very straightforward. 1 plus 1 equals 2. We all know this. But why? What do you need to know before you get to this equation? Well, you need to know how to add, that this is addition. You need to know that. You need to recognise these squiggles as numbers with a particular value. You need to recognise these squiggles as addition and equals and understand what you do when you come across those particular terms. So process-based knowledge. And you have to understand how all of this operates together. So you have saw this, I'm sure, when, we, when you had a look at this vlog and went 1 plus 1 equals 2, obviously. But epistemology is all the stuff you need before you get to this equation the theories of knowledge. And as you can see, in something as simple as this, there is a huge amount of knowledge you need before you get there. So epistemology, depending on your philosophical branch, questions why we believe what we believe, why we call something the truth, how we have justified the fact that it is the truth, and also it's about information, waiting of information, why some information has value and other information sources have less value. So the last in the last century or so, debates about epistemology have been split between true belief and knowledge. True belief and knowledge. So you might believe something to be true, but that doesn't have to be knowledge. Knowledge has a greater weight an evidential base compared to true belief. Okay, so when we start to get to ontology and methodology, you start to see how that weight and justification is put in place. There are two ways in which we acquire knowledge, and both are used in research, both are used in doctoral programs. A priori knowledge and a posteriori knowledge, posterior knowledge. So prior knowledge and posterior, at the end knowledge. They're the two types of knowledge. So a priori knowledge is the knowledge that is known independently of experience. A priori knowledge known independently of experience. Non empirical knowledge that you come to via reasoning. So knowledge that is acquired separately from experience. So a posteriori knowledge, knowledge that is gathered from experience, posterior, end. Knowledge that is gathered through experience. So you experience all sorts of stuff and that gets you to knowledge. Okay. And that's, of course, what we often call the empirical or indeed empiricism. Sadly, I think, particularly in the 21st century, the empirical often spills into empiricism. 
and we have this notion that the only way to gain knowledge is through experience. But there's a whole branch of knowledge that doesn't engage with experience or empiricism or the empirical at all. Therefore, we have to start to think through what sort of knowledge we develop through experience and what sort of knowledge we can develop without experience. Because let's be frank, let's be frank here. You might experience Donald Trump's tweets. But what knowledge are you actually gaining through the reading of those tweets? You've experienced them, but is that giving you knowledge about what's going on in our Trump age? Yeah, so they're the different types of knowledge systems. There are lots of branches of philosophy. Empiricism is one, idealism is another, rationalism, constructivism, all sorts of historical philosophical branches. So in your research, what I need you to do today is start to think about your relationship with experience. So are you assuming that if you experience a chain of events like an experiment, that's what an experiment is, a chain of events, that if you experience that, then that is knowledge. Now, if you do, that's great. That's your epistemology. If you have a theory of knowledge before you engage with the data, then that's your epistemology. So have you got a sense of the theory of what knowledge is about before you engage with any evidence, right? Any, any data sets, then that's your epistemology. So epistemology is a branch of philosophy that reminds you to consider the origins, the nature, the methods, and the limits to your research. Basically, if ever you get confused about epistemology, ask yourself, how do I know what I know? How do I know what I know. And that is the epistemolo epistemological question. And most of you know when I do work around the world on information and media literacy, when I'm teaching that, I'm doing consultancy on that, I often start with the other question, how do you know what you don't know? How do you know what you don't know? And that's when we start to deal with literacy models. But there's no doubt you have to know what you know first. And I always remember Bertrand Russell from his great book, I think it was published in 1950, Unpopular Essays, what a great title, Unpopular Essays, and Russell stated, science is what we know, philosophy is what we don't know. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So epistemology asks us as scholars to ask the difficult questions about the limitations to knowledge and how we justify those limitations. What are the sources that we use to verify knowledge and what are the legitimate sources we use as evidence to make our case? Now, this is a big deal. When I was completing my research masters uh, at the University of Western Australia in history, the evidence, the sources that I used for this thesis were fashion, popular music, and I used a whole series of fanzines. I investigated, I think, 40 years of Beatles fanzines. And needless to say, the conservative historians in my conservative history department were absolutely horrified because they stated those sources, that's not evidence. Popular music is not evidence. Fanzines are not evidence. Fashion is not evidence. So the weight or the burden of proof, the justification of knowledge, they argued, was a problem. So as you can see, we have a series of biases about what we consider evidence or valuable information, because we, as scholars, tend to believe high culture. We tend to believe the empowered sources that remain from white people, from men, and from colonizers. That's often seen to be important, valuable information and material from the working classes, citizens of color, men and women with impairments, children and young people, that sort of stuff is very easily dismissed as not actually being important information. So you can see what's going on here. So what I'd ask you to do is start to question how you know what you know, how you know what you know. And therefore, epistemology starts to open out discussions of method and methodology about how you know what you know. So epistemology is crucial to your PhD, and to your research career, because it makes you unpick 
and probe what you think, how you gain your knowledge, how you prove your arguments. So always remember that epistemology at its most basic is justified belief. How we justify our research results. And to summon the legendary René Descartes, quote, no more useful inquiry can be proposed than that which seeks to determine the nature and scope of human knowledge, end of quote. The nature and scope of human knowledge. And if you think about it, that's what a PhD is doing. It's probing and pushing just a bit the scope of human knowledge. And that is an epistemological act. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.